Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The doctor said, in the doctor's opinion, Bill asked for the privilege to share his story with others, and it's a privilege. It's also an integral part of my recovery. Um, I do, however, always try to say a disclaimer. I, I'm passionate about Alcoholics Anonymous. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I had nothing when I got here. I was spiritually in, in debt. I was below ground in every way, materially and emotionally. Uh, I was an abusive, awful human being, uh, and I have been transformed by Alcoholics Anonymous. Having said that, I can, uh, you know, it's like if you went in anything in my house and you picked it up, including my children, and turned it over, on the bottom it says, property of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, <laughs> and I, but as a result of that, it's been so profound and so interior in so many ways. I mean, a lot of things are better on the outside, but I know that I will not be able to convey to you what has happened to me in Alcoholics Anonymous. But my hope and my my... What I'm fueled by is you've all had happen, it's happened to you or it's happening to you right now. So I'm just hoping to connect with that. And there are a lot of people here I was watching within their first couple of years of sobriety. And that is remarkable, A, that you came to this conference in your first couple of years of sobriety. Right on. Have fun in AA. But I also want to talk a lot to you um, because that's the hardest time. You know, I've been sober since May 16th, 1993. And I remember the 90s. Uh, Hey, they were tough, you know. Not only was the music crappy, but sobriety was hard, too. Um, and that's, I'm a musician. So, uh, so May 16th, 1993. So my hope is that I will speak a little bit enough about what it was like so that you can relate to me that I have alcoholism. But I'd really like to talk about recovery because it's an amazing, dynamic, life you know, giving thing. Um, so uh, I grew up in Southern California, and um, my parents were not alcoholic. Just by the luck of a genetic mistake, my parents were not alcoholic. Because they're, um, you know, I, I don't blame my alcoholism on them. I, they were loving, kind people. And I always want to say that from the podiums of Alcoholics Anonymous, because I sponsor a lot of men in AA, and I know that that's not true for all of us. And my parents have passed away during my recovery, and I want to honor them and say they were kind, loving people. Right, uh, so I don't blame my alcoholism on something that happened to me in my childhood. However, um, they, they, I am Irish Catholic, and I blame that on them. And, uh, you know, Catholic-ish, but. Uh, but um, I, I really am not kidding that it j skipped a generation. My grandfather, I was told, um, on my father's deathbed, he said to me, he said, my dad knew the guy that started your club. And I said, what do you, I didn't know what club he was talking about or what he meant. And, you know, I was, my dad and I were very close and he was about to pass away. And he said, you know, that guy, Bill Wilson, he came over and tried to help my dad. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, and you're telling me this now, right? <laughs> so I have no hip. Um, but it makes sense. Cornelius, my grandfather, was a, an investment banker and died in 1945 of alcoholism. So it makes total sense to me. Um, however, I grew up in what I thought was a happy home. You know, um, the funny thing, like we all can agree, right? You know, you grow up in your house and you think that's how houses are, right? My dad was bipolar. I didn't know what that meant. I just, he was moody. And uh, my, I'm the youngest of four in an Irish Catholic family, which is a wonderful place to grow up. You're always being picked up and sung to and told stories. And we tell stories at my house. You know, my mother, who is a very quiet, observant woman, we looked up one time when we were all having dinner. I said, what are you thinking, Ma? And she said, I'm thinking in this family, when you lose your breath, you lose your turn. <laughs> and uh, that's how it was around. So I had a lot of, I have a lot of great memories. However, as my brothers, I'm seven years older, I'm seven years younger than the next one. My sister was born a year later. My brother was born a year later. My brother, and then seven years. So my name is Matthew. That means gift from God. That's a marketing spin from my father. <laughs> He, 
he was like, you're kidding me. When my mother said, I'm serious. He, they were, seriously, he was unemployed. He was like, it was not happy news. But when my brother above me, who was named after Cornelius, oddly enough, when he um, was about 13 or 14, he started drinking alcoholically and he destroyed the happy home I had. So I decided I'm not going to drink because I love these people. They're so nice all the time. And my dad was really funny and boisterous and loud. And my mom was real calm and loving. And, and my mom was so observant. You know, um, I, was, I was real skinny in uh, high school and in junior high. And um, not as skinny as I got becoming an alcoholic and a drug addict. But I, got, I, was, I was naturally a skinny person. And uh, I never think about putting that together. But... Um, my mom came home in seventh grade. I, I had acne all over me, and I was uh, real. I weighed like seventy pounds. And she was a school teacher, and she said, "You don't get picked first for the team, do you, honey?" <laughs> and she was like very quiet and loving. And I'm like, "How does how does she know?" You know. And uh, she said, "Do you want to play an instrument?" I said, "Oh my God, I want to play the guitar." You know. Uh, there was a poster of Eric Clapton, a life size poster, in my room. As soon as I found that poster, I put it up and built the altar. You know. And uh, and she got me a guitar, and we had no money. And that's the kind of parents I had. They were loving and kind and observant and focused on us as individuals. And it changed my life. I became a professional musician because my mother looked at me and said, you don't get purchased for the team, do you? And, but I, 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 I had that guitar, and instead of drinking, I played it all the time because I could hear my brother screaming and yelling at my parents, and my paper route money would disappear, and, and the cars would disappear. And he sold my surfboard, you know, uh, Living with an alcoholic is a lot of fun, and um, I just decided I'm not going to do that to them. And I went to a small Catholic school. I always joke, you know, I was drug up by the witches of God. I had nuns for teachers, and, and they were scary. And uh, I remember when I was 14, I was sitting in the front row, I was president of the class. And Sister Dennis Ann looked right at me and said, if you're even thinking about sex, you're going to hell. <laughs> And I thought, oh, my God, you know, and because uh, sometimes when I brush my teeth when I was 14, I'd forget to think about sex for a couple minutes. <laughs> but uh, but I looked around the room and there's Casey and Sabo and Smitty and, and Shape. And I thought it's going to be crowded now, man, you know. <laughs> But that's what I grew up with, you know, like I thought God hated me and I was just starting, you know. So, uh, but senior year, um, my buddies never questioned me why I didn't drink, but we were at Casey's house. It overlooked the Pacific Ocean in Hermosa Beach and they had a bottle of tequila and six guys in a bottle of tequila and in Catholic school, that's called a party, you know. There are no girls, I noticed, and uh, being the non-drinker. But my brother was homeless then. And my parents were distraught, and it was very dark in my house, and my father wasn't treated for his bipolar, and I just remember feeling like I was the most awkward person alive. I, I had all this acne, I was super skinny. I played in a rip and rock and roll band. I dated the head cheerleader, and I just was wondering when I was gonna learn what everybody else knew. I don't know if that's an alcoholic thing. From the outside, I looked like, the, the, like I had it going on. On the inside, I was so confused and afraid and, and embarrassed. And they were taking shots of tequila. And, and I said, you know, I'll have a shot of tequila because I just couldn't stand it anymore. It wasn't that I wanted relief. I just didn't want to be different again. And they were like, you sure? It's tequila. And I don't even know what that means, you know? And I'm like... <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. It, you know, they're little glasses. What could happen? And uh, <laughs> I'm standing here, you know. So uh, I took this shot at tequila, and only you know what happened. That's why I kind of like talking about it with you, you know. And it went down my throat. It hit my chest. And 12 years of Catholic school guilt melted out of my shoulders, you know. And, and my acne went. <laughs> and it was, whoa. And there's like wind blowing through my hair and I was uh, suddenly I was athletic and good looking and funny and um, and then I ran and <clears throat> I got a much bigger glass and said can I have some more please and because uh, it was the answer and I suddenly understood my brother and I got a big glass of tequila and I drank it down because I wanted to be even cooler and uh, then I got up to go to the bathroom, and I'm walking down. They had uh, eight, another Irish Catholic family. They had eight brothers and sisters. We were home at, without them. We were all by ourselves. But they had this huge house with all these bedrooms. And I'm walking down this thing, and now I'm on a cruise ship. You know, it's like, why is it moving? I was here yesterday. It was fine. And uh, 
I go into the bathroom, and I always thought they were a wealthy family, and they had dial soap, so I always thought dial soap was the, the soap of the wealthy. And it, uh, <laughs> you know when you're a kid and you make these little, yeah. So I go in, and it smells like dial soap, and I sit down on the toilet, and then the room starts to spin, and I don't, I don't know why that's happening. And, uh, you know, I'm a good Catholic school kid at that time, and my last thought before I blacked out was, you know, God would not make a body that could defecate and vomit at the same time. <laughs> because Sister Dennis Ann said God was perfect. <laughs> and that's not perfect. <laughs> and there are some of you laughing just a little lower in your belly. I think you know <laughs> that God did make us that we can do that. Our consciousness unfolding is what I call him now. But, uh, and I blacked out. And I woke up, the best part of this story for me is I woke up in a sleeping bag with my head on a pillow and it smelled like bleach. And I didn't know why I slept in the bathroom when there's eight bedrooms in this house. And then I looked around I, and my friends had found me in between functions and cleaned me up and stuffed me in a sleeping bag. And I, I rode to school and I, was, I had been cool for 15 minutes and then I was a pig. And uh, I, I just felt this intense guilt. I felt like my brother. I remembered the few stories I heard about my grandfather, and I decided I wasn't going to drink. Uh, some people say, you know, I got drunk the first time. I felt that amazing feeling. I threw up. I got in a fight. I got arrested, and I couldn't wait to do it again. I just was mortified. And, and then I went off to college. And uh, I don't know if this is going to resonate with a lot of you, but I went to Chico State, right? <laughs> yeah. Where the motto is, I think I went to Chico State. You know, it's, uh, it's one number one party school in Playboy magazine like 15 years in a row, right? So I forgot when I got to Chico State that I didn't drink. I forgot I didn't smoke pot and do acid too, but this is an AA meeting. And, uh, and I just, it was on, you know, but I was so uptight and that I drank and went to class. I smoked pot. I went to class. I got two degrees. I actually, for the, for the purposes of our story, I ended up getting a second degree by accident. I um, took a, I was getting a music degree, and I switched to, to literature, and I loved it, but I took all the religious studies classes I could get my hands on because I'm thirsty for that kind of stuff, and I ended up with a degree in religious studies that I wasn't trying to get. And uh, my counselor came in and said, you have a minor in religious studies. So that's nice. And uh, I graduated, and I did that all for my parents. I went to college to make my parents happy. By this time, my brother's in AA. He actually got into AA just before I left for college, and he had been living in his car, and then he moved in, and he was living in, in our house. And I remember looking at him in the bathtub reading that blue book, thinking, what's in that blue book? What is the magic in that book? Because my brother was a liar, a cheat, and a thief, and I loved him more than anything, and he hurt me worse than anybody ever did on the whole planet. And um, I went off to college, and then I, as soon as I got out of college, I started playing guitar in a band. I was in a band, but I got into a better band and a better band, and then I stayed away. And um, I lived on the East Coast, and uh, I, you know, I always think this is all I have to say about what it was like for me is I got kicked out of a rock and roll band for drinking too much. <laughs> I always think that's kind of funny. It wasn't... Um, <laughs> I didn't think it was funny at the time, and uh, I mean, in, in all seriousness, I drank my dream away. I got the dream people want. I was writing music for albums and touring around the country and the world, and I got thrown out of this band. And the funny part about that is the guy who kicked me out of the band, he, he did, had to drink almost a whole bottle of wild turkey to get enough courage to kick me out of the band for drinking too much. And, uh, but they were right. You know, and, and I came home and I lied. And I lied and I told everybody in Southern California that I came home because my mother was dying of cancer. And um, the truth was my mother was dying of cancer. And the lie was that I cared. That's hard for me to say because I really love my mother. But I would have stayed away. I, 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 there's a pretty good chance I would have missed her funeral if I hadn't gotten thrown out of that band. And I love that woman. I, I, I'm so dedicated to who she is to me. I've already told you the type of person she was. So I came home and I got a job. Um, I got a job as a waiter in a restaurant. And I was thinking, that's cool, because then I'm still kind of an artist, right? Yeah, I'm not <laughs> right? going to plan my comeback. And, uh, and then they came to me and they go, you have two degrees. And so yeah, they go, do you want to be a manager? And I was like, oh, God, that's so lame. You know, and that, that's beneath me. That's, you know, 
I'm 31 years old. I, I played CBGBs, for God's sakes. I'm not going to be a manager of a Marie Callender's restaurant. <laughs> but I needed money. I owed everyone, and some of the people I owed were killers. And uh, <laughs> so I said, yeah, okay. And, and then I was thinking, how this is the lamest your life has ever become. And I'm walking around and the guy's like, okay, so this is the, the schedule with all the cooks on it and here's the meat, uh, dates they deliver the meat and, and here are the keys to the bar. And I went, you know, maybe this job's okay. And, uh, and then he goes, and here's the phone numbers for all the waitresses. I got this, you know, and uh, and sadly, that's how I managed the restaurant. There were these people that would come in. They were so irritating. They were called customers. <laughs> and they would sit there and keep the place open, you know. And, uh, and I'd hover over them. And then they would leave. And I'd go, come on, girls. Drinks are on a house, you know. And some of those girls were 18. Some of them were 20 and 21. I'm 31 years old. And the plan was get a few drinks, go home with one of these girls. And sometimes that happened. You know, they, the girls would go, well, I remember these two girls came up to me and they go, we just got an apartment and we got a hot tub and maybe you can come over. And I thought, well, why? I mean, we have this bar. <laughs> like we have free alcohol. Like it's free. And they're like, Oh, and they were like, look, very confused by my choices. And, uh, and looking back, I'm confused by my choices. But, um, but the day they fired me, uh, which stunned and confused me, I actually said, you can't fire me. This job's beneath me. And, uh, and they're like, that's funny because you didn't even do it. And, uh, but I was headed down the stairs and this girl stopped me and she said, I'm pregnant. That's what I said. <laughs> but I said it was so much more feeling. And, it, you know, I always hate this part of the story because I'm taped. It's okay. But um, it's true. If you lined up the women at Marie Callender's, I could have gotten pregnant. I would have said, not that one. <laughs> it's okay, women. Hate me. It's okay. I'm speaking at an AA convention. <laughs> not running for president. Yeah. <laughs> Although I guess I could now, but uh, that used to mean something. Anyhow, uh, I didn't, I thought, you know, this is the sickest part of that. I thought this girl who was 18-ish was uh, selfish and self-centered. I was 31. And I thought, not her. And she said, I'm pregnant. I couldn't even comprehend. I just got fired. I couldn't believe it. And I see her. I can't even hear her, you know. And then I walked across the street. I, I'm such an alcoholic. I'm so arrogant. I, I slammed the door of the employee parking lot and marched out there knowing I don't have a car out there. <laughs> I, I got a car. Well, I have a key. I just don't know where the matching mechanism went. And I haven't seen it for a while. And so I went out there and pretended to get in my car and drive off, but I snuck around to the bus stop in the front of them, and, and it was right in front of an Alano club, and I didn't know what that was. And uh, I hope I don't offend anybody. This is just what happened. There was, um, there was a school there for mentally challenged kids, like uh, people with different, on the spectrum, Asperger's and different things, and they were taught how to, you know, take care of themselves and cook and clean and, and take rapid transit. Then they're in their young, early 20s, and there were like six or seven of them standing there, and I'm standing there, and I'm, I'm just crying. I got snot running out of my nose. I got my Marie Callender patch on. <laughs> Our kid, I wanted to sink into the ground, and I'm waiting for the bus to come, and I step off the curb onto Pacific Coast Highway, and I look to see if the bus is coming, and nine of these kids kids yell, don't stand in the tree, don't stand in the tree, and they scared the hell out of me, I, I like jump, I'm like, do you see, do you see a bus, I don't, because I was at a point now where I took some things that kept me awake a lot, and I saw things that weren't there, and I didn't see things that were there, and so I knew I couldn't trust me, and then I thought, Jesus, Matthew, you have two degrees, and these kids are better at waiting for a bus than you, and I went home, and I decided I was going to drink myself to death. And I started drinking and I started selling my guitars. And this girl kept coming over and she was more and more pregnant. And I didn't, I, my mother was dying and I would call her, I guess, I, I, would, I would just sit on the couch and hold my breath when, when someone would come up on the porch. You know, I lived two blocks from the beach. I could hear it 
and I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what that sound was because I never left my apartment. Uh, by May 16, 1993, I weighed 108 pounds. Um, I'm five foot ten, and I weigh 168 pounds today. So I don't know where I lost those 60 pounds, but you could see all the way through my skeleton. You could see me, and, and I didn't know that. I wasn't weighing myself. But I did. I'd call my mother and say, "I'm going to come visit you," and I believed with all my heart I was going to go visit her, and I never did. I remember she would say, that would be lovely, darling. And I'd hang up the phone, and I'd go start to get dressed, and I'd see myself in the mirror, and I'd think, man, I got warrants out for my arrest. I can't remember if I told him about this baby, because I lied all the time. I was the guy that if I was your friend, I was your problem. And by the end of it, nobody came around my apartment. My mother and my father were a great example to me. My father was a lovely man. He, was a, he worked like a horse. He just had a work ethic and a kindness. My father was a World War II hero. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He liberated Dachau. And my father cried when he saw someone die in front of us once in a car accident. He sobbed. He just had a sensitivity and a kindness and a love for me. He championed me everywhere I went. He was so proud of me. And my mother was just kind and loving. And they treated each other with such respect. And I knew how it was supposed to look. And when that girl was eight months pregnant, I pushed her down a flight of stairs. And I didn't, I didn't want to hurt her. I would never, I would never hurt a woman. I just wanted her to stop yelling at me, and she wasn't yelling at me. She was standing in the doorway of this apartment saying, hey, we got to go to the doctor. The baby's due soon. Maybe you shouldn't drink today. And what I heard is, you're a bum and you're a drunk. And I took a risk and I pushed her out the door. I just wanted her to get out the door. And I had no control over myself, and I pushed her way too hard, and I knew that I did, and I closed the door, and I went back inside, and I drank about this much gin in about 13 seconds. And I'll tell you what that'll do for you. It will erase your memory. I heard her hit those stairs, and I went inside, and I never looked to see what happened. So that's what it was like for me. I was born with every advantage. I was a loved human being. I'm a talented man. I've been given gifts by God, and I don't know why God gave me these gifts. I've done everything I can to ruin other people's lives in my life, and I almost killed an unborn child. And I became an animal drinking alcohol. When I drink alcohol, all bets are off. When I drink alcohol, only I matter. I can remember that selfishness. You know, I've been working hard at AA. I worked really hard at AA for 25 years. Here's the middle point of selfishness. I'm this much farther away. I have this innate thing in me. And what happened, so what it was like, what happened was Mother's Day was coming. My sobriety date's May 16th. I think it was May 8th that year. And my brother called me the day before. And just by accident, I answered the phone because I never answer the phone. And he said, hey, it's mom's, it's maybe mom's last Mother's Day. We're going to meet down at King Harbor Yacht Club. The brothers and sister are flying into town. It may be your last Mother's Day. He said, I know you're having car trouble. Got to love Irish families. You know, if you're, we don't like to, if it's cars missing, we just call it car trouble. And uh, <laughs> I know you're having car trouble. And, I, and he said, so I'm going to come get you. And I said, okay, that'd be great. And he said, we don't want you to miss this. So I'm already a little angry at him. Why would he think I'm going to miss it? I guess he heard about the phone calls. I forgot about the phone calls. I'm coming to see you, Mom, and then never showing up. So the plan was, I sat down, hung up the phone, go, wow, mom, you know, it's mom. It might be mom's last Mother's Day. I'm going to get a card. I'm going to write her a great, a great letter. I, I'm, I write very well. I'm going to get her some flowers. I got to get cleaned up here. Maybe I'll get a haircut. I should do my laundry, you know, and then I just got a little bit more gin and, uh, and then he honked his horn. I sat on that couch for 18 hours getting drunk. I didn't sleep, and I didn't get dressed, and I didn't buy any flowers, and I didn't get a card. And I looked out the window, and I thought, oh, God, you know, I did it again. And my brother, I walked outside because I looked around my apartment, and suddenly there were a lot of things that were hard to explain. I don't know if you have these in Canada, but we have these blankets that keep SWAT teams out of your house. And you just put them on your windows. They're SWAT-proof blankets. And uh, <laughs> I 
I had some SWAT-proof blankets carefully in place, you know, for the puke that lives in apartment 10A. You know, they're going to come through my window. I don't, I don't know what I'm thinking. And I got, I was making collages late at night that were kind of hard to explain. And, uh, you know, I didn't do the dishes because I was single in my head. And uh, so I ran outside. And I remember my brother looked at me through his car window and his eyes got really big because no one had seen me. And I weighed 108 pounds. And I sat down in his car, and he just stared at me. And I went, and I don't want to get into too much detail, but I ruined Mother's Day. I don't even know exactly what I did. I, I'm very close with my oldest sister, very close. We talked three or four times a week. And uh, I asked her a few years ago, I said, what happened at Mother's Day? And she goes, we're never, ever going to speak about that. You were vile. You were vile to our mother. I don't know why. I, I love her. I, can't, I could never even lie to my mom. I would just break out in the truth. She just had this presence and beauty and pr love for me. And I ruined it. I don't know. I don't know what I did. No one will tell me, but I remember their faces. And I've been up all night. I was just babbling, breathing fire. And my brother mercifully took me home. And when we got, we drove home, we got in a fight, you know, to... We don't know what the fight was about. We just started yelling at each other. You know, if you're in an Irish Catholic family, like, yeah, that makes sense, right? We're just yelling at each other. It wasn't what I just did. It, we still, we've talked about it since. He's like, I don't remember what the fight was about. And we get there, we get, but thank God, you know, there's a thing called grace in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's a lie. There's a thing called grace in the universe. And we get a lot of it here in AA. And grace is an unwarranted gift. And you never see it coming. I've never seen it coming. I'm going to tell you a lot about grace for the next half hour. But I didn't see the grace coming in that fight. I thought it was another lame fight where I was the younger brother and I was getting told off. And I got out of the car and I slammed the door. I just ruined Mother's Day. I can't draw a sober breath. I'm unemployable. I owe everybody money. The police want me. Other people want me. I can't open my door. I'm crippled with fear. And I thought... I'm sick of losing this argument. I felt I had the moral higher ground. My brother was such an obnoxious member of Alcoholics Anonymous that he had a house with 12 steps to the front door. <laughs> like what? <laughs> Can't compete, you know? And, uh, and he's... So I call him. I wait till he gets home. I give him like a half an hour to get home. And I call him. I just start screaming at him. Grace is coming. I don't see it coming. I think I'm just going to win a fight. And I'm screaming and yelling at him. And I and I finally, I, I, all these years of being the little brother. And, and, you know, I went to college. I graduated with honors. They never did. He was homeless. I played CBGBs. I've made several albums. I've done everything I ever said I was going to do. And he always talked down to me. And I just let him have it. I just let him have it. And when I got done yelling at him, I was just kind of out of steam, and I'm standing there holding the phone. It was connected to, uh, by a cord to the, to the floor of that phone, and it was on a shag, green shag carpet. I remember every detail because what happened next changed everything. It wasn't what he said. He said, Matthew, I think you have a problem with alcoholism. I had been told that by far more important people than my brother. <laughs> And I had lied about it and said, that's ridiculous. My brother was an alcoholic. He lived in his car. That was not the grace. I didn't know what I was about to say. And I don't know if any of you can relate to this. But I said something I didn't expect to say. He said, I think you're having a problem with alcoholism. And I said, of course I am. And I surprised even me. I look at back at that and I think God hit me between the shoulder blades and the truth popped out. <laughs> And I look back at that moment, and I can remember the way that my skin felt in the sunlight coming through the Venetian blinds. I can see the little dust in the light slats. I can see the green shag carpet. I can see the empty gin bottle. And I think the reason I can see all that is because just for a nanosecond, I stepped into the present moment, and I told the truth. And you know what I'm going to tell you about for the next half hour is that the present moment is always pristinely perfect. It doesn't matter the circumstance. And I'm, I'm going to hopefully back that up with something. But I said, of course I do. And then my brother comes back with the funniest thing he could have possibly said. He said, don't go anywhere. <laughs> and I go, oh, OK. <laughs> I was going to move to that end of the couch in October. But uh, <laughs> if you're coming over, you know, uh, I mean, I hadn't gone any, anywhere, you know. and. Um, 
And the beautiful thing is, my brother lived a half an hour away, and he was standing on my walk, walked in my door ten minutes later. Because my brother knows the most valuable thing, the most valuable thing, if you're going to get the grace in Alcoholics Anonymous, is willingness. And he heard a window. And for all of you that are new, I worked step one over the phone to my brother. I admitted. I love that word because it's a surrender word, right? I, I knew it, but I wasn't copping to it. And then I admitted because every day that I woke up, if I slept, when I woke up in that apartment, I thought, don't drink today. I was so tired of drinking by the time I stopped drinking. I wanted to stop a long time ago. Get a job. Do your laundry. Go see that girl's parents. Tell her you're going to be a stand-up guy. Go visit your mom. Clean this apartment. That's what I would think. And then I get into the shower and the water hit my face and I think, it's not so bad. I'll go next door. Just have a beer. I'll just have a beer. Beer never hurt me. Over and over. And I didn't realize that when I woke up in the morning and said, don't drink today, I might as well have said to me, the alcoholic, hold back the Pacific Ocean today. Because I'm powerless over alcohol, and I never didn't have alcohol or something in my system. If I was out of everything, I just smoked cigarettes like they were heroin, you know. I just sucked them to, you know. And then I feel a little something, and I'd have another one. And my brother shows up, and he looks in, he inhales in my apartment, he goes, let's go to the beach, you know, because it wasn't copacetic in there. And, uh, and I remember I grabbed a pack of Marlboro Reds, a pack and a half, and we went down to the beach, and we sat on a lifeguard stand. And I had thought my brother was going to come to my house and kick my ass, and I was never going to drink again. The one-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> And I kind of thought that because on the outside of my life, I've described to you a really, really tip of the iceberg of what it was like on the outside of my life. It was a wasteland. It was a moonscape. It was so much filthier and more disgusting inside of me. I kind of hoped somebody would just walk through that door and punch me in the face. And my brother didn't. My brother was a really solid member of AA, and he sat on the other side of the lifeguard stand, and he looked over my head, and I always try to tell this story exactly how it happened because it's really important. My brother lowered his eyes and looked into my eyes, and he started talking to me about how he felt when my mom and my dad kicked him out of the house when he was 18. And I remember that day because I couldn't believe it. I was 12, I was 11 years old, and I couldn't believe we did that to one of our own. That the Mitchell, we let that happen. And, and he told me how he felt that day. And then he started talking to me about how he felt when his wife and son, he, he got his high school girlfriend pregnant, and they got married, and they kicked him out. And I remember that day, because I was about 13, and he called me on the phone, and because he had no one le left to call. And he was sobbing into the phone, and he, and he said, I, I can't believe it. And I said, I was 13, I had the clarity of youth. And I said, why don't you stop drinking? And he said, you don't understand. And I didn't because I hadn't had a shot of tequila yet. And he started talking to me about how he felt when he lived in his car. I remember when he lived in his car because I would ask my dad if I could borrow his car to take my guitar and my amp to school. I'd drive super early in the morning and I'd go all to the places where he used to park. He had a primer gray Cadillac, a 52 Cadillac. He called it the newcomer apartment later in his life. And, uh, <laughs> and I would find him and I'd look in and if he was in there and he was breathing, I'd just leave him a note. I love you, Matthew. I got sober BC before cell phones and I would leave him a, a little note. And, and then if he wasn't in there, I'd leave him a note. But I never talked to him. He was either passed out in the car or he wasn't there. And he started talking to me about all these things. And right in the middle of it, just looking me right in the eye, he's describing how I feel sitting on that lifeguard stand. And I didn't think anyone on earth knew how I felt. It's exactly the way it's outlined in the big book in the chapter called Working With Others. My brother was a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I would love to say I had a moment of clarity and I surrendered, but the truth is, and I'm not being funny, I ran out of cigarettes. And he kept talking. And I need to go, because I need to put something in me. It's coming time, you know? And, uh, and he, uh, so I threw up my hands, I'd, so he'd leave. And I said, you know what, you're right, man, I gotta go to AA, and I meant it. I meant it. I said, I need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And he looked at me and he laughed, and he goes, you're not going to AA? I go, I'm, I'm not? And he goes, no, you're going to a hospital. 
And I looked at him and I said, yeah, I don't think I can do that. I'm, I'm busy. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> busy? Yeah. And then I go, well, like, how long? And he goes, I don't know, 30 days. And I'm like, whoa, 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 you know. I can't leave all this. <laughs> and I really believed it. You know, it's like, who's not going to pay my bills? <laughs> you know? And he looked over my head. He totally ignored that. And when we walked up to the house, he said, hey, man, he looked at me and he goes, do me a favor. I go, what's that? And he goes, don't die. And I thought he knew about the gun that I put in my mouth at night. And I was really embarrassed. And I was like, God, how does he know? And then on May 16th, 1993, he was supposed to come pick me up. So May 15th, I got really ready. You know, I'm not a slacker. I drank like a gallon of vodka. And I smoked a bunch of things that were in the carpet. I don't know what they were, but uh, but they were there, and I was there, and you know, and I didn't want to leave anything for anyone. And uh, and I passed out standing up, and I know that I passed out standing up because I woke up with my head against the wall, and the kind of a crooked position, and it hurt. And the phone was ringing, and I had fallen on a big gulp. It's just the mystery big gulp because, you know, that's funny to you. It's not funny to do that. It, uh, it's sticky and it's gross and it's and uh and I live two miles from 7-Eleven and I never left my house so I guess a Martian put a big gulp down and I fell on it and uh I only answered the phone because I thought it was my brother and it was this woman and she said hey we've been looking all over for you your daughter was born today and I had totally forgotten about them because I'm so selfish and self-centered that the news of the day was I'm going to rehab not I'm having a child. And she said, can you get to the hospital? I said, yes. And I grabbed my key. I jumped up. I have a big gulp stuck to my back. I don't know what that is. I don't. I got uh, scrubs on from the OR. We used to wear those to the beach. Surfers did. And I had a T-shirt on and flip-flops. And I ran out looking for my car. And I, uh, I'm like, I got a splitting headache. I got a terrible hangover. I don't know grace is coming. I don't know grace is coming. And I get in my car. I found it. It had like 50 tickets on it. It's a miracle that it was still sitting there in Redondo Beach. It should have been towed. I threw all those tickets in the back seat with their cousins. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, that's where the ticket the compartment is. And I started that car up. And I, I think this is so funny. You know, I am selfish and self-centered. I am like inside my DNA. I'm selfish and self-centered. I'm so selfish and self-centered that I drove to the hospital where I was born. <laughs> <laughs> They're not there, and uh, I just know babies come from there, and uh, so I went there, and the poor old lady, there was a little candy striper who was like 105 years old with blue hair going, you can get as mad as you like, they're not here, you know, and I'm, and I don't know that it's like the Pirates of the Caribbean, I'm this skeleton going, look again, you know, and, uh, and I don't know that that's how I'm coming across, I think I look like Marlon Brando, you know, and... Uh, and she said, so I go back and, and I put my head on my steering wheel and I started to cry and I thought, I'm just going to go home and kill myself. I'm not going to be a father. I'm a terrible waste of a human being. I'm going to go kill myself. I'm going back to plan A. And I started the car and the car jerked and into my head came the name of the hospital. That's called grace. I meditate quite a lot. I meditate twice a day. I have for many, many years. I know enough about my thinking mind that I don't get to pick what comes into my head. Thoughts come into your head. Some of them you register, some of them you become part of. But I did not make the name of the hospital come into my head. It just did. And my car drove to that hospital. I did not go home and blow my brains out. And I went into that hospital, and the, the parents of that teenage girl were walking out the glass doors on the other side of the, the lobby. And that's grace, because I wouldn't have made it up to the room. And I ran up to the room. I ran up the stairs, and I'm looking, trying to find the room, and I'm not prepared for what I'm going to see. And I turn the corner into the room, and there's Anna. And Anna looks really weird. Have you ever seen a woman that's just had a baby? They look really weird. Uh, she has um, her hair's matted, too. She has these, her breasts were like, just like weeping willows, and she uh, kind of like the elephant man, like, I, I'm not an animal, you know. It's, uh, I'm not running for president. I'm trying to tell you the truth about what happened. And uh, she looked really weird. And, uh, and I run in there, and I see her, and she's glad to see me. And the last time I saw her, I almost killed her. And she looks at me with joy, and she looks so bizarre, and she's coming at me, 
And, and as she's coming at me, I think, oh, my God, she's going to hug me. And then as she gets within arm's distance of me, I thought, my God, she's so beautiful. Something happened to her. She's beautiful. There's light coming out. There's like she was glowing at me. And I felt terrible. And she said, she came at me and she didn't hug me. I thought, oh, God. And she turned and she lifted this little perfect being out of this plexiglass box. And she handed me Phoebe Rose. And Phoebe Rose was perfect. She had this giant Irish cranium. <laughs> and uh, she screwed. Anna's Irish, too. And uh, big blue eyes and just these little fingernails. And, uh, and I felt disgusting. I didn't feel love. I didn't feel love for her. I, I wish I did. It would be so much cooler if I did. But I felt filthy and dirty and like I didn't belong in the same planet as these people. They're beautiful and pure and I'm a disgusting, awful animal. And I lied. I, I said to Anna, everything's going to be great. And what I was thinking is, I'm going to go shoot myself. And I gave the baby back to Anna and I left. I was in that room for less than a minute. And I ran out there, and I got that car going, and I know exactly how I'm going to do it. And I'm getting to the house, and I run up the stairs, and my brother's standing on my porch, Grace. And he said, I packed your stuff. Get in the car. And I said, no, I got to go inside. He goes, why? I packed your stuff. So I got in the car. So that's what it was like. That's what happened. When I got out of recovery 30 days later, fact, I gained 47 pounds in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, like, look about like I did now. And uh, I gained 47 pounds because they weigh you on your way in and they weigh you on the way out. And on the way in, the guy went, whoa. <laughs> and I said, what? He goes, nothing. 108, you know. And, uh, and I got out and my brother drove me home and my brother said, go to a meeting. And I remember thinking, God, these AA guys are so intense, you know, <laughs> go to a meeting. You know, I've just been 30 days in a hospital. And uh, so I lied and said, yeah, that's what I was going to do. <laughs> but I'm lying. I'm going to go see Phoebe. I'm going to go see my mother. I'm going to get some laundry done. I got, I've got 30 days, man. And I open up the door and I walk into my apartment and somebody hands me a beer. Actually, it wasn't a beer. It was a Coors. <laughs> uh, so that helped. But uh, And I looked around, and there's girls in bikinis snorting cocaine off my table, and they're smoking pot in my kitchen, and they're dancing to music. And I lived in that apartment all by myself. But they found out I left, and they broke in. And I'm holding this beer, and I backed out of that apartment, and I put that beer on the porch, and I ran away. And if you're new in AA, I want to tell you why. I didn't have a moment of clarity or, or foundation. I did have a moment of clarity. I didn't have a foundation of recovery. I didn't have a connection to a higher power. What happened was I got this beer in my hand, and I was so expecting silence and, and space, and there was all these people in this party, and I had this beer in my hand, and I looked up, and I realized I had nothing. I don't have character or self-respect or prospects or love. I have no chance of ever getting out of the financial hole I'm in. I'm never going to get a job again. But I had 30 days, man. And that's all I had for me that, that was mine. And I thought, just for a second, are you going to throw away 30 days on these losers? Not this time. Grace. And I ran to a pay phone and I called AA and I told him almost everything I've told you so far. I was a rock and roll star, man. I had a baby and my mom's got cancer. Of course. Ah! You know, I'm like, I needed help, you know. Sorry about that. I needed help. You know, and I thought if they understood my problem, they'd send a car and a therapist and a bottle of water. And we'd be good, you know. And uh, the guy listens and he goes, wow, uh, okay. And he goes, where are you? And I said, I'm on the corner of Burl and, and Prospect. And he goes, oh, my God. I said, what? And he goes, there's an AA meeting, and it starts in 15 minutes. It's right across the street from where you're standing. Grace, grace. And I, I honestly, I said to the guy, what do you think I should do? Because <laughs> I'm like, that's awesome, but I think I explained. I have problems, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> And the poor guy, I would love to meet that guy. You know, he's like, he goes, you, well, you, you got to go to that meeting, man. And uh, 
But I didn't want to go to that meeting because I didn't know you. I'm afraid of you. I had 30 friends, and they were at the hospital. They were going to be my friends for life, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and I walk in that meeting, and I was terrified. And a guy walked up to the podium. I'll never forget what this guy said. He's dressed in a suit. I sat down in the one chair. Remember when there's one chair and you're new? <laughs> and you're like, ah, i got to walk across the room. And there's like 300 people in there. It's called Stompers. It's an old meeting. And I put my hands on the edge of that podium, and I said, the guy, the, the guy got up, and he put his hands on the edge of the podium. I'll never forget the guy. He put his hands there and he said, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> I'm like, what? Wah, 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 wah. And you guys are loving it. You're like, ah, I love it. <laughs> and I'm going, what? I need help. What? <laughs> and, uh, and then he pointed to the steps and he goes, those are tools for living. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I read him and I'm like, well, why are they in Chinese, man? You know, like... I need help. Like, you read the steps when you're new, and you're like, it's like, what? Came to believe, what? Before that, like, I got, like, the law is after me, you know, and uh, <laughs> that's really nice, but I got issues, and uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure I don't talk forever. Uh, so uh, I, I stayed for the Charlie Brown Christmas special, and because uh, I got nowhere else to go, you know, and... Um, and I finally, I, I get up and I'm leaving and, and a friend of my brother's walks by and he says, hey, aren't you little Matthew? And I said, yeah, I'm a little bigger today, but, uh, <laughs> and he said, uh, I heard you look like crap. That's what he said to me. That's how you welcome the newcomer in Southern California. And I said, uh, well, that was 30 days ago. I've been, I've been working on myself. <laughs> I mean, like I slept and I ate. That's the extent of my hard self-help. And uh, and he goes, well, can I give you a ride home? And I said, that'd be great. I ran here. <laughs> you know. And, uh, and then he walked to his car and, he, and I kept slowing down and he kept getting, he goes, hey, what is your problem? And I said, I don't think I can go home. And he said, why not? And I told him about everything. And he said, oh, you can't go there. And he said, what about... Uh, where do your parents live? And I go, oh, no. And he goes, I think they live near here because my brother was in a good group, you know, and my mother was dying of cancer, and his group came over, and they painted our house. I mean, they did, they were good AA guys. And uh, he said, I said, you can't take me to my parents' house. And I, I really want to make this kind of the crux of this is I had a perception of what my parents' house would be like, of what that would be like. And the perception was, look, man, I'm fresh out of rehab at 30 years old. I got a... a, a illegitimate child across town. I'm in deep, deep trouble. This loser is not showing up on those nice people's porch and ruining their night. They're madly in love with each other. My mom's dying of cancer. My dad's beside himself with fear and sadness. This would be the worst possible scenario. It's untenable. It's embarrassing for all parties. It cannot take place. That is my perception, right? That's exactly what I thought. This guy drops me off at my parents' house. Because you don't listen to newcomers, right? And uh, <laughs> I've learned that's a pretty good rule, but I didn't know it at the time. And uh, drops me off, and, and he drives away. And I walk up there, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't want to go in there. Those are good people. I don't want to go in there and humiliate them. I told you what my perception was. But I walked up on the porch, and a weird thing happened. I looked down on the porch, and there was a guitar pick with my name on it sitting on the porch. And my dad is a fastidious man. He's a very clean man. And I know I dropped that guitar pick like three years ago at the earliest. And I don't know why it's sitting there. And it froze me on the porch after I rang the doorbell. Grace. My mother and father came to the door together and my because they're from the Midwest. They're from Illinois. And, and my mother was strapped to oxygen. That took a long time. I just kept staring at that guitar pick, puzzled why it was sitting there. And they opened up the door and they were glad to see me. It escaped out of them. They couldn't hide it. I told you my perception. The reality was my parents were married for a long time. They were madly in love with each other. My mother was dying, and they were laying awake, praying and worrying about their boy Matthew. And he showed up on their porch and said, will you help me? It couldn't have been more perfect. I didn't know that. I couldn't possibly know that. So the lesson is, my perception and reality have no relationship to each other. That's only slightly better now. And I go to India to meditate. I mean, I've tried really hard to pull those things together. But uh, 
I walk in and my dad and my mom are just, it, it was so amazing. Now, was it great? No, I was terrified in there. I was like, holy crap. I went back into my bedroom. There's Eric Clapton. I go, I'm home, you know. And he, my dad said, you can stay in there. I woke up in the morning and thought, oh, my God, I'm at my parents' house. It wasn't a nightmare, you know. And I had a little directory, and I ran out to my dad and said, hey, there's a 7 a.m. meeting. Can I borrow the car? He said, Matthew, if you're going to a meeting, don't ask me. Just get in the car. So I said, thanks, Dad. I was just trying to get away from the uncomfortable place. Then I went to the other uncomfortable place. <laughs> you guys, you know. And I'm like, oh, here we go. Wah, 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 wah. And, uh, and everybody's, oh, we're happy, you know. And I walk in, I got one pair of shoes that have acid, battery acid that burned through them, you know, and I go inside, I sit there, I drink my coffee, I go, okay, it's been an hour, I can't take these people anymore, I think I'll go back to the other uncomfortable place. I did that three times a day for a year. I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter why you go to AA, just go to AA. Because I heard stuff, and I, I know there were some turning points, and I want to tell you a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. One of the turning points was, I went to this meeting, and it was a men's stab, stag step study, and it was in a circle. And when I walked in, it was the third meeting I went to. It was Tuesday night. I walked in, and I, I, I had the feeling that everyone was staring at me and talking about me. And I talked about this at the workshop earlier. And remember that when you're new and you walk in a meeting and you think everyone's staring at you and looking at you? I, I have news for you. You landed in the epicenter of self-centeredness and selfishness. <laughs> we are not talking about you or thinking. We're looking at you, resting our eyes, and self-obsessing. And... Uh, <laughs> And that's actually not true. And a really good group, people might be looking at you and wanting to get to know you. But I walked in there, and there was one chair across the room. So I went up to the coffee, and I'm filling up the coffee, looking around, figuring how I'm going to get to that chair. And I fill the coffee up so high that only surface tension is keeping it in the cup. <laughs> and now i got to walk across the room, and I'm like, I can't. I don't even know how I'm going to do this. And there's carpeting. All my little bat senses are up. And I walk across the room, and I'm just pouring all over my hand that AA triple hot coffee. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm going, it's fine. It's fine. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. It's fine. <laughs> and now everybody is looking at me and talking about me. And, uh, and I, nothing changed in my mind. And I just sit there. And then I remember the guy said, we're going to do a step study today. We're going to read a step. If you haven't worked a step, please don't share. And I went, cool. <laughs> And I sat back, and uh, they talked, wah, 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 an hour went by, I ran home, I had to do some first aid, and uh, <laughs> fell asleep, woke up, Groundhog Day, I'm in my parents' house, get the thing, go to meeting, meeting, meeting. Seven days later, I go back to that meeting, because I know where it is, that's why, and I need to get out of the uncomfortable place. And I walk in there, and I sit down in that chair, I filled up my coffee halfway, <laughs> college, <laughs> And uh, I go sit down in that chair, and I look around, and everybody that was there the week before was there again. And that meant something to me. I thought, oh, my God, they're not hiding. They're not running. They're sitting here, and they were laughing. I started to see them. And then a couple of meetings later, I don't know what step they were doing, but uh, one of the guys told this really embarrassing story, a really revealing story. And I kind of perked up because I come from an Irish family, and if you open up a little vulnerability, we attack. You know, and I'm like, well, this will be cool. We'll make fun of this guy for an hour. I can be finally a good meeting, you know, and uh, and the guy tells this. And then another guy raised his hand. I'm like, I can't wait to hear what this guy says. And the guy goes, yeah, I did that. But when I did that, I was wearing a women's thong, you know, like, <laughs> no. Yeah. And then another guy said, oh, I did it underwater with a bottle of Vaseline. I'm like, whoa, no. <laughs> and and I got clean inside because they told the truth to each other. And they loved each other, and I'd never seen it before. And I got clean inside. All I did was go. So if you're in here and you're one of those people that has a year or two years and you're smoking cigarettes out there and you're like, yeah, I'm having a problem with the God thing, you know. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I particularly love it when they go, you know, I'm an intellectual, you know. <laughs> I'm a thinker, meaning I'm not as stupid as you. <laughs> and... uh and I'm here to tell you, if you got a year of sobriety or six months or eight months and you're a drunk like I am, you're not having a problem with the God thing. It's working perfectly. <laughs> you're having a problem with semantics. I went to Catholic school. You know, I 
Thought, I thought God's will for me was a smoking hole in my desk, you know. In fact, when I went there and we got to the 11th step, I had a sponsor. We were going through the 11th step, and he said, uh, I said, you know, I, I love these steps. I'm paying the money back. I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm going to his house every week. We're reading the book. I'm doing the steps. I'm getting involved in stuff. I go, but this prayed only for knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry that out. I don't get that, man. That's too ambiguous. And he goes, what do you mean? And I go, what do you, how will I know God's will for me? And he wasn't particularly spiritual, but he said, look, don't think about it so much. Just relax. So I came back to him a couple days later, a couple meetings later, and I said, you know, I don't get it. And, and he said, look, I thought about this. He said, you're way overthinking this. He said, when the alarm clock goes off, God's saying, get up. When a bill comes in the mail and says, pay this amount, God's saying, hey, pay that amount. You know, and he, <laughs> when, when Sophie, when Phoebe is smelly, God's saying, I think it's time to change the baby, son. And uh, he said, just do the next indicated thing, and you're probably doing God's will. And, and you know, it sounds so simple, but it changed everything. I got to tell you a couple more things. I, I was walking into a meeting with him one day, and I said, you know, I love Phoebe so much. I thought it was like the worst thing, and it turned out to be the best thing, this little baby. And, and he goes, nothing, walks right by me. So then the meeting's over. I'm self-centered and insecure, so I want to drive home my point. And he comes out, and I go, hey, maybe you don't understand what I was saying because you don't have a child, but I think I love this child more than I love myself. I was 60 days sober. And he goes, stop it. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, how much child support do you pay? And I said, God, I live with my mom and my dad, and I work on a loading dock in the middle of the night, and then I go to three meetings a day. He goes, oh, I know all that. How much child support do you pay? And I said, well, I don't pay any. And he goes, then you're kind of full of it, aren't you? He goes, this is a program of action. You must know that. You go to a gazillion meetings. It's not a program of talk. He goes, I got an idea. Why don't you show me you love your daughter, and you'll never have to tell me again. We had a super quiet drive home. <laughs> I'm planning his death, and he's living in the present moment. <laughs> and I got home, and I'm pacing around my bedroom going, what a jerk. i got to get a new sponsor. And I already told him a lot. And, and I'm talking to Eric Clapton, who's there with a cigarette on his guitar, going, yeah, he's a jerk, you know. And uh, I talked to Eric for a year. And... Uh, I'm pacing around my bedroom, and then I realize my face is like hot. It's so red. And I know what that means, because I've been on earth a long time. That means somebody told me the truth, and I can't stand it. And I sat on the middle of my floor, and I pulled the phone over, and I called Anna and said, I don't make much money, but I should give you some help. And she goes, oh, my God, that'd be so great. And she I said, how much do you want? And she goes, oh, no, no, let's not do that. Let's do a percentage of your income. <laughs> Smart girl. <laughs> I way underestimated her powers. <laughs> Great mom, by the way. Probably the best mom I've ever seen next to my wife. But she said, uh, why don't I do a percentage? And she named a percentage, and it would have changed my lifestyle. Not at all. I stood with to live with my parents and drove a crappy car and had a lame job. So I'm like, yeah, that's fine. So every two weeks, I went over there, and I paid that money. Every two weeks. Every two weeks, Right. And I did that because I don't ever want to drink alcohol again. I didn't do that to be a good dad. I did that because I never want to go back to hell again. But what happened was I was playing with Phoebe like a year into this. She's banging her giant head against me and she's grabbing my face. She loved me. I'm the fun guy that comes over with money every two weeks, you know. And, uh, and I'm holding her. We're spinning around. And I grab her and I go, Phoebe. And Anna heard this. I go, I'm going to be your dad for the rest of my life. I'm going to be there. I'm going to take you to your first day of kindergarten, darling. I'm going to take you to your first day of first grade. I'm going to take you to your high school dance. I'm going to embarrass the hell out of you. I'm going to buy you a car, and somehow, I don't know how, but I'm going to pay for college because I'm your dad. And I was so in love with that idea. And a year before, I saw her, and I thought, I must go shoot myself. You changed me. You changed me. One of the most important things you said to me, because I'm a thinker, is he said, we don't care what you think. We care what you do and do the action of the steps. And I paid that money every two weeks for years. And I'll tell you what, it's not, it, it was part of an amends. But when people say to me, I'm going to put myself at the top of my amends list because clearly I've hurt myself the worst, I, I'm, I'm sarcastic and Irish and I have to hold back. 
And I say, you know what, man, why don't you put yourself at the bottom? And if you make all those other amends, you may find out it's no longer necessary to make amends to yourself. That's grace. That's grace. So I have a couple more things to tell you that are vitally important, or you're all going to drink tomorrow if I don't get this out. <laughs> so much power. And uh, no, I, so I got these lame jobs, and then through a series of events, I got a pretty good job at the airport, I, at an airline, at Qantas Airline, and I was living with my mom and my dad, and you know, I learned a lot. I held my dad while he cried at night. My war hero dad's like, what will I do without Dorothy? That was the question every night when I got home. He'd lean against me and cry. Me held the mighty man. And then we held my mom. We took care of my mom. I cleaned her up. I held I was holding her in my arms when she died. But in between time, I got this job at the airlines. I'm going at night. I'm going to all these meetings. I'm going to the airport. And I bought a guitar on my way to work one day. I bought a Taylor Dan Curry single cutaway with an Ibanez pickup. And if you play guitar, you're jealous of me now. <laughs> it's beautiful. I, I don't have it anymore, but I, it got stolen. But I had a I took it to work, and I was dying to show somebody because my mom and my dad don't want to see it. And I got uh, hired by the vice president of the airline who was in AA at the time. The guy who was was in AA, and I didn't have any friends at work. They're like, don't trust the new guy. He doesn't drink, and he actually likes this job, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I took the, I walked out to the bus stop that night with my guitar, and this woman from British Airways was standing there, and I turned to her, and I said, hey, can I show you my new guitar? And she turns to me, I'll never forget her. She looks at me and she goes, I don't look at strange men's guitars. <laughs> and she gets on the bus and I'm like, what a bitch, you know? And, uh, and I thought, she thinks I'm hitting on her. Get over yourself, lady. I just need two eyes to look at my guitar, you know, and, uh, and register how cool I am. And uh, I get on the bus and it's packed. It's the Brad, Tom Bradley terminal at LAX. It's really crowded and I'm right up against her. And she's sitting there looking really uncomfortable now. And she has a book in her hand called Surprised by Joy by C.S. Lewis. And I looked at it and I said, I wanted her to calm down. So I said, hey, I've read that book. I just wanted to diffuse the tension. And she goes, well, cut to the chase. Do you believe in God? In this beautiful British accent. And I started vibrating. And I, God saved my life. You know, and uh, <laughs> that's what it sounded like to me. Because her face drained of all the color. She was like, oh, God, it just got worse. You know, and... Uh, <laughs> And she said, well, I'm on the fence. I don't think I believe in God. And I said, well, tell me about the God you don't believe in. And she started talking about this God, and I was listening. And while I'm listening, I thought, God, she's really pretty. And I'm really comfortable. And all the men in the room know that's called a spiritual awakening. I, <laughs> I'm not lying. I'm not an astronaut all of a sudden, you know. I'm just listening. And I remember one thing I said, she finished talking like, you know, I don't, I don't believe in that God either. I don't know who would believe in that God. And she said, well, what kind of God do you believe in? I said, I couldn't even describe it to you. It just is. It's a, the consciousness unfolding. It's the energy that animates all things. It's working in your favor if you align yourself with it. And we got off the bus, and she was so beautiful, and I was so calm, and she never did look at my guitar. And I said, hey, do you want to forget about this guitar and go to dinner? And <laughs> she did not think so. <laughs> Wow. Like, she's like, oh, right, look at my guitar. I've read that book. You know, and I'm like, whoa. And I, I remember I said, no is a complete sentence. And she said, okay, no. And I said, that's really too bad. And she kind of leaned back. And she walked away, and I walked away. And I went home, and my dad was going to cry on my shoulder. And I stopped him. I said, hey, Dad, I met a girl, and she felt like home. And I blew it. And he goes, really, what happened? And I told him this story. And he goes, hey, my dad used to say stuff to get me to shut up. And he said, that's not over. So I took it as a shut up now kind of thing. And I go, OK, I think it's over, but OK. And I went to work the next day. And I remember I grew spiritually because I didn't tell anyone she was a lesbian. <laughs> um, yeah. It's her business, not my business to tell anybody that. You know, it's like. <laughs> and I'm not really kidding. You know, it's like she couldn't have rejected me. She rejected my whole gender, you know. and. Uh, <laughs> And I didn't think about her. I went to work. I didn't think about her more than 133 times while I was there. And uh, there's just something magical about her. And so I didn't want to get shut down again. So I ran to the bus stop that I knew she wouldn't be on that bus because it was the early bus. I finished early. And I heard these high heels. And she tapped me on the shoulder. And she said, I think I was rude to you. 
yesterday, I don't want to go out with you. And I said, yeah, you've been super clear about that. You know? <laughs> and she said, but maybe we could have coffee and, and miss this bus. And I thought, okay, we're going to have coffee to make her feel better. I'll take it. Right. And, uh, and we had coffee and we missed all the buses. And uh, we had coffee again. And, and two and a half weeks later, Philippa proposed to me. And we've been married for 23 years. <laughs> Miracles happen here. I converted a lesbian at Tom Bradley Terminal. <laughs> Standing right there. No. She did. She proposed to me. Two and a half weeks after that, and I've never had a moment where I thought it was a mistake or what the hell am I doing? I thought, oh my God, grace, grace. I stood on, my mom got to go to my wedding. In fact, my wife is so beautifully giving. She said, let's get married in Chicago so your mom will go home one more time. And we got married in Crystal Lake on a little house on the lake. And I remember I walked out of the pier and I looked up at the sky and I said, thank you, God, that this is the next indicated thing. Because the next indicated thing isn't always a bill or a dirty diaper. Sometimes the next indicated thing frequently, the next indicated thing makes your heart blow up in your chest with joy. I've had it over and over. Philip and I had two children together, Rory and Sophie, and I, I was in the car with her, and I went to the right hospital, and, <laughs> and the only other people in the room with us were Anna and Phoebe. I took Phoebe to her first day of first grade, and I cried like a baby. I took her to her first day of second grade, and I cried like a baby. In sixth grade, she said, Dad, don't come. You're hard to explain. <laughs> that was the word she used. You are hard to explain. <laughs> I bought her a car when she was 16 years old. She totaled it two weeks later. No more cars for Phoebe. If you're doing the math, Phoebe and I turned 25 on May 16th. We both have the same birth date, and Phoebe will grab. She just did. She just finished today. She finished nursing school, and I paid for it. <laughs> Yesterday. And she, she, called, she texted me just before I came out here. I gotta read it to you. Dad, I just needed to tell you how much I love you. Call me when you get a chance. I, I get frustrated because I go to these AA conferences and, and it's always like, you know, I was a terrible person. I robbed banks, I killed people, and now I have a beauty queen for a wife and I'm the CEO of three companies and uh, butterflies fly out of my butt, you know? It's like, <laughs> it's like, I got sober and I'm better than anyone. And, uh, and, you know, life isn't like that. You know, people come up to you in AA meetings and they go, everything's going to be all right. If you're new and you heard that, that's a lie. <laughs> because think about it for just a second, right? Hey, you've been a terrible person all your life. Or I'm sorry, you've been a sick person all your life. And now that you don't drink, everything's going to be all right. Like, it's just going to be beautiful. That's not true. You know, my mother died in my arms. You know, I, I've had moments of great sublime. I've had moments of very challenging difficulty. When I was married for five years, I've been married for 23 years. When I was married for five years, I walked through the door, and my wife was bouncing across the floor having a massive stroke. We hadn't had, an un, we hadn't had a fight. We have never fought in those first five years. We traveled all over the world. I walked through the door, and she was falling backwards and bouncing across the floor, and everything changed. For 18 years, I've been my wife's caregiver, and my children have been uh, the children of a, of a disabled mom. And I can tell you, we don't want it any other way. Because exactly in the present moment, exactly how it is, nothing is ever wrong. Sometimes my perception gets all screwed up. Is it ever going to be? Why can't it be? Is she ever going to? Are they ever going to? That's all future past, future past. But right here, Philip is a beautiful, vibrant, lovely human being. She's here. Some of you got to meet her. She is the heart of the house, right? She can't use the left side of her body, and she's not reliable enough to do anything with her brain. But she is the best companion I've ever had. I love her more than life itself. And I'll tell you this because I came to AA, and I threw a pregnant girl down a flight of stairs, and I didn't care. And I got in the hands of you people, and I did these steps. I can't emphasize it enough. Get a sponsor and work these steps. They never end. They never end. I need these steps more than I've ever needed them my whole life.
Can you guys go five more minutes with me? Okay. So I, I want to tell you, you my perception, right? I don't understand my perception. We did it, man. Pip and I are like, we're not going to let this stroke change everything. We're going to carry on. And we raised some wonderful kids. We just adopted another child. My, my daughter, my wife made me adopt my daughter's best friend. And I mean it. She made me do it. <laughs> because every time my wife says, we're going to do something, oh, yeah, Miss Disabled, I'm going to do that. We're going to get chickens. Okay. I have chickens. We're going to keep bees. Okay. I don't think she's ever seen those damn bees. I go out there in a suit, you know. But you don't always know what's happening. And we raised these children, and, and we taught them. This is how life is, man. And my son is a beautiful, beautiful man. He's 20 years old. He's tall and handsome. He's my revenge against all those damn cheerleaders, you know. And he's, uh, he's kind and he's loving. But I didn't know what they were going through. And my son wrote an essay to go to college, and uh, he gave it to me to proofread. And I want to share part of it with you. As a child, it is hard to understand why systems sometimes fail or break. As a child, it is hard to understand why your parents stop laughing. Shortly after the birth of my younger sister, my mother suffered from a severe stroke caused by a weak artery in her neck. After this, things were different. My mother walked with a limp and had trouble reading books to us. My father walked like a ghost and forgot how to warmly hold his two small children the way he once did. I firmly believe that every time life pulls the earth from under your feet, it sends a rope in after you. After my mother's stroke, friends of my father would come over during the week to help us out, and every Sunday night they would have a men's AA meeting in our backyard. As a child, they became my family. They slowly brought laughter and love back into the house that had become so cold. They were the men and women of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they never left us. They gave me the right questions to ask of life and practical advice on how to navigate my way through it. They taught me that everybody is trying their best, so we must always be kind, honest, and forgiving. And their words have served me over and over again my entire life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You realize you're applauding for God, right? All right. So stay, stay here for just a second. If you're having a problem with a God thing, I want to talk to you. You see, yeah, sit down. You can do that all again. This is the deal with God, okay? I had a meditation in Austin, Texas once before I had to speak, and every speaker had a problem with the God thing, right? And I, I thought about it in my meditation, and I thought, you know, if a Martian landed next to you in Austin, Texas, which you've ever been to Austin, that could actually happen. Um, and there's a guy playing bluegrass on the porch, and there's a girl playing mandolin, and somebody playing the fiddle, and the Martian says, what's that? And you go, well, that's music. And then you walk through the town and you walk into the gazebo and there's a blast band playing band music. And the Martian says, what's that? And you go, well, that's music. And he goes, that's not music, man. You told me that was music with the wood and the strings. And you think, yeah, but that's music too. And then you walk to the river and some woman is singing a cappella. This actually happened to me in Austin, Texas. And it's echoing through the chambers of the, of the canyon. And he says, wow, what's that? And you go, that's music. And he says, I think I'm having a problem with the music thing. <laughs> And the word music is as useless as the word God is for describing what it is because it's a dynamic, present thing. It can't be held still. It can't be categorized. It can't be conceptualized. You just have to develop an ear for it. And the only way I've ever found reliably, and I have a degree in religious studies, to develop an ear for, for the God and welcome his grace is written right there behind me. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.